Um, okay, so before we get started, um, just want to note that those of you who are doing the uh, presentation on A Room of One's Own and uh, Professions for Women, we should meet to talk sometime by the end of the week. Uh, so just uh, come talk to me after class, we'll set something up. Um, also, for next time, what you were reading are these selections from the Voices from World War I section. Most of these are poems. Um, <clears throat> you will find them all in that particular section. So we're going to be moving from talking specifically about um, Irish issues and Irish national identity, particularly in relation to Britain, um, to uh, Britain's role in the First World War and the psychic impact that the First World War has um, on that early 20th century generation of Britons. Um, okay, uh, so before we get into today's material, does anybody have any questions about anything that's happening or about any assignments or whatever? No? All right, great. So. Um, I do just want to say a couple things about the songs um, that were being played at the beginning of class. So all of these are relevant to the story, right? Um, <clears throat> the Lass of Falkrim and Arrayed for the Bridal are actually uh, contained within the story. You know, they are performed by a character within the story. The Lass of Falkrim is an old Irish folk song. And it concerns um, a young woman who has been seduced by the local lord. And she comes uh, to the castle gates at night uh, with their child dead in her arms. And she's crying to be let in. So it also sort of mirrors Greta Conroy's uh, situation with Michael Fury, right? Um, in particular because it is a song that he used to sing to her. Um, <clears throat> Arrayed for the Bridal, and the only, it's not a song that's performed much anymore, so the only version of it I could find on YouTube was that dude playing the accordion. Um, <clears throat> it's from an opera by Bellini, the name of which escapes me at the moment. But this is the song that is sung uh, by Aunt Julia. Uh, when she's doing her little performance piece for the party. And the song is ironic um, for reasons we'll get to as we talk about the story. Um, now this first one, O Ye Dead, is a song composed by the Irish poet Thomas Moore. And this is the song from which Yeats took the title of the story. Um, in Moore's song, the living and the dead are standing you know, on opposite sides of a river, staring at each other. And each is explaining why they envy the other. And why they want what the other has. Okay, so with that, and you know, all of this is stuff that's going to sort of come out in our discussion of the story. How did this go for you? What did you think of it? It was okay. Okay? <laughs> it was okay? It was Okay, it was it was not I was expecting okay. it more based off the time I was expecting it to be more. And it really wasn't really much to me. Yeah. Okay, so so were, were you expecting it to be like scarier in some way yeah, or something? I was expecting it to be like a ghost story in it. And mm -hmm. I'm sitting here the whole time I was reading, I'm looking like, well, where they're gonna be like some ghosts, because I'm going based off yeah. the title and it wasn't to the end. In a way it is a ghost story, but not in the literal sense, right? There aren't any literal ghosts, but the entire party in its aftermath is kind of haunted by memories of the dead, right? Yeah. Most of the conversation is about people who have died. Yeah, that's true. Um, there are images all over the Miss Morgan's um, home that speak back to the dead. And indeed, even uh, you know, Gabriel's final conversation with his wife, right, concerns her memory of this dead boy from her childhood in Galway, right? 
So yeah, it, it's not a literal ghost story, but there are still ghosts hovering all around it, right? And that Christmas setting should also kind of put us in mind a little bit of Dickens' Christmas ghost story, right? I think there are actually some, uh, there, there's a, there is some cross current there. Um, in part simply because, now this seems weird to us probably, but you know, one uh, <coughs> common folk tradition at Christmas going into the early 20th century uh, was telling ghost stories. Because you know, it's, you know, it's you know, the shortest days of the year, right? It's dark, it's cold, people huddle inside around their little fires. And you know they sit around telling each other you know scary stories. So a lot of what this story is concerned with is the discrepancy between what Gabriel Conroy thinks is going to happen when he gets his wife back to the room in the Gresham Hotel and what actually happens. So let's actually start there because this is a good place to kind of start unpacking Gabriel's character and his little his progress, right? What does Gabriel Conroy think is going to happen when they get back to the hotel? Yeah, he is thinking that they are going to get a lot closer, right? Right, you know, there are all these you know, sort of references to, you know, you know, Gabriel's blood pumping and singing, right? And so Gabriel, thinks they're going to, they're completely simpatico, right? They are in tune with each other right now, and that once they get back to the hotel, they're going to have the best sex of their lives, right? Yeah, he, he did keep constantly mentioning something about lusting over the girl yeah, the whole yeah. time, even mm -hmm. when she was telling him, even when she was telling her how he felt about someone passing in, he kept thinking, like, sexually, I guess. Yeah, well, and, and part of this is because he, he's disappointed, right? for a couple of reasons, right? One, because what he thought was going to happen isn't going to happen. And also, because all this time that he and his wife thought, and he thought he was you know, completely in tune with his wife, completely in sync with her, right? She wasn't thinking about him at all. She was thinking about this boy that she had known in the distant past when she was young, right? So, you know, at the, at, the time of, at the time of the story, Gabriel and Greta Conroy are around 40 years old. So Michael Fury is in her distant past, right? You know, she knew him when she was 17. It's been, you know, 20, 20 plus years since, since he died. But Gabriel doesn't seem to like to be reminded of anything from his wife's past. And again, I think reasons for this will sort of come up, right? But the reason this is important is that most of James Joyce's stories are built around what he calls an epiphany. Um, does anybody know what an epiphany is? Does anybody? Pardon? Does it have something to do with kind of like a tragedy or it's like an aha moment, isn't it? It is, yeah, exactly. It's like you, when you get this kind of sudden revelation, right? Where you see everything as it really is. At least like that, like that that's kind of Joyce's sense of it, right? So I think in the more colloquial sense, yeah, it's like we use it for any kind of aha or eureka moment, right? But in Joyce's sense, yeah, he's talking about kind of the moment when everything is revealed to you as it truly is. What's revealed to Gabriel in the mirror as he's talking to Greta on page 438 is not particularly appealing, right? If you look on the uh, bottom of page 437, Gabriel felt humiliated by the failure of his irony and by the evocation of this figure from the dead, a boy in the gasworks. 
While he had been full of memories of their secret life together, full of tenderness and joy and desire, she had been comparing him in her mind with another. A shameful consciousness of his own person assailed him. He saw himself as a ludicrous figure, acting as a penny boy for his aunts, a nervous, well-meaning sentimentalist, orating to vulgarians and idealizing his own clownish lusts, the pitiable, fatuous fellow he had caught a glimpse of in the mirror. Instinctively, he turned his back more to the light, lest she might see the shame that burned upon his forehead. So, when Greta makes this revelation to Gabriel, what does he realize about himself? When he finds out that all this time she's been thinking of, you know, poor dead Michael Fury. thinking about himself necessarily the role of husband here. If we look at the thoughts, the, the thoughts that he has. He saw himself as a ludicrous figure. What does it mean to be ludicrous? Uh, I think you're thinking a lunatic. So something that's ludicrous is something that's ridiculous, right? Something that's absurd. He saw himself as an absurd figure acting as a penny boy for his aunts, a nervous, well-meaning sentimentalist, orating to vulgarians and idealizing his own clownish lusts, the pitiable, fatuous fellow he had caught a glimpse of in the mirror. Um, do you guys know what fatuous means? No? Okay, fatuous means foolish. So if we look at this pattern of words here, right? Ludicrous, fatuous, Clownish. How does Gabriel look to himself in this moment? And how is this different from the way he seems to usually see himself? Yeah, his nervousness at the party, right, was about this speech that he had to give, or he was worried that he was gonna sound too snobby and too overeducated, right? And now his, now his fear is that he is this ridiculous, foolish figure, right? that his own person is somehow absurd, is laughable, is ridiculous. Subject for mockery. And we can actually kind of see this building over the course of the night, right? He has a variety of encounters with different women at the party, all of which end poorly for him. So, right, what happens, for example, with Lily, the caretaker's daughter, when he uh, first comes into the party? She what? Upset, but she said, um, you should, at some point, be seeing you get married, right? Uh-huh. And she comes back at him bitterly, right? Mm -hmm. You know, she says, the men that is now is only all palaver and what they can get out of you. And he doesn't know what to say to that, right? So he made this innocent, well-meaning comment that made, frankly, a lot of assumptions about what it's like, right? And she comes back, she kind of snaps back angrily, and he doesn't really know what to do about it, right? So what does he do to paper over the situation? Then you Yeah, he presses a coin into her hand and says, oh, hey, it's Christmas, right? Hey, so, <laughs> Merry Christmas, bye, right? So he tries to sort of buy his way out of the discomfort, right? And 
And then if we look at the encounter with Miss Ivers, If we go uh, go to page 418, can I get somebody to start, to, can I get a volunteer to read uh, for us from uh, near the bottom of the page, Lancers were arranged. Lancers were arranged. Thank you. Gabriel found himself partnered with Miss Ivory. She was a frank manner, talkative young lady with a freckled face and prominent brown eyes. She did not wear a low foot bra and a large brooch, which was fixed in front of her collar, wore from Miss Ivory's device. When they had taken her places, he said abruptly, I have a protocol with you. With me, said Gabriel. She nodded her head gravely. What is it, asked Gabriel, smiling at her solemn manner. Who is GC? answered Miss, Miss Ivers, turning her eyes upon him. Gabriel called it and was about to knit his brows as if he did not understand what she said at once. Oh, innocent Amy, I have found out that you. Right for the Daily Express. Now, aren't you ashamed of yourself? Why should I be ashamed of myself? Asked Gabriel, blinking his eyes and trying to smile. Well, I'm ashamed of you, said his eyes, was trying to say that you write for a rag like that. I didn't think you were a West Britain. Okay, so first off, it would probably help if we unpack Miss Ivor's appearance and her language a little bit, right? to demonstrate exactly what she is meant to represent in the story. So what does she look like? Mm -hmm. She has brown eyes. You have freckled face and prominent brown eyes. And how is she dressed? She's wearing a low cut. She's actually wearing a not. She's actually, it specifically says that she's not wearing a low cut bodice, or a bodice right? So she is, she is wearing very modest clothing. Now, the people that Joyce is describing in the story come from this Catholic middle class that emerged in the 19th century that we were talking about over the last two sessions, right? So <clears throat> these... Um, Catholic Irish people who had largely um, adopted middle class English social values, if not religious or political values, right? We will see, for example, that Miss Ivor certainly has not adopted English political values. So the fact that she doesn't wear a low cut bodice, or she's dressed most conspicuously modestly, and what else is she wearing? Yeah, a brooch with an Irish device, right? So that is meant to signify Irish nationalism. So Miss Ivers is um, a nationalist. And we get more of this from her conversation with Gabriel, right? Why is she why is she upset with him? Why is she annoyed with him? Because she said he worked in the Daily um, Express. Yeah, he's been writing a literary column for this paper called the Daily Express, right? Mm -hmm. And why would that upset her? What does she call the, does anybody understand the significance of what she calls him for doing so? Yeah, she calls him a West Briton, and he doesn't like this, right? Mm -hmm. So a West Briton, right, this is an insult that is meant to refer to an Irish person whose sympathies and preferences Are English. So an Irish person who acts like and thinks like an English person. The Daily Express uh, was a pro-British paper that was published in Ireland. So the fact that, like, even though, like, the fact you know, that the column that he writes 
has nothing to do with politics, right? He just writes reviews of books. The fact that he writes for this paper, the Daily Express, signifies to Miss Ivers a betrayal of Irish nationalist ideals, right? And if we look at Gabriel's thought process as he thinks about how to respond to this, right? A look of perplexity appeared on Gabriel's face. It was true that he wrote a literary column every Wednesday in the Daily Express, for which he was paid 15 shillings. But that did not make him a West Briton, surely. The books he received for review were almost more welcome than the paltry check. He loved to feel the covers and turn over the pages of newly printed books. Nearly every day when his teaching in the college was ended, he used to wander down the keys to the secondhand booksellers, to Hickey's on Bachelor's Walk, to Webb's or Massey's on Aston's Key, or to O'Clawhessey's in the By Street. He did not know how to meet her charge. He wanted to say that literature was above politics, but they were friends of many years standing and their careers had been parallel, first at the university and then as teachers. He could not risk a grandiose phrase with her. He continued blinking his eyes and trying to smile and murmured lamely that, she, that he saw nothing political in writing reviews of books. So what do we learn about Gabriel from his thought process here? as he tries to formulate a response to Miss Ivers' accusation. What do we learn about Gabriel's character and his interests here as he tries to formulate a response to Miss Ivers? Right, he care about who to think? Okay, yeah, that he, he doesn't want to look stupid, right? So he's trying to be very careful about how he responds to her. He's like, he can't risk a grandiose phrase because he doesn't want to look ridiculous. Although we all know that he is, in the end, going to end up seeing himself as ridiculous. But what else, like, like what, what kinds of things get his attention, right? What does he seem to care about? Okay, yeah, he does seem to care about what people think of him, right? But when he's talking about why he writes this, when he's thinking about why he writes this column, right? What does he care about? The yeah, the books, right? And not even what's in the books, right? Just the aesthetic sensation of holding and smelling a new book, right? He is very much focused in the sensory pleasures of holding a new book, right? And this is something that we see him doing across the story, right? So he is very much, he's very attuned to sensation. Um, there's a point at which he is uh, looking out the window, for example, um, let me see if I can find it. Right, page 421. He's listening to Mrs. Malin's talking. Gabriel hardly heard what she said. Now that supper was coming near, he began to think about his speech and about the quotation. When he saw Freddie Malin's come across the room to visit his mother, Gabriel left the chair free for him and retired into the embrasure of the window. The room had already cleared, and from the back room came the clatter of plates and knives. Those who still remained in the drawing room seemed tired of dancing and were conversing quietly in little groups. Gabriel's warm, trembling fingers, here's the aesthetic sensation part of this, tapped the cold pane of the window. How cool it must be outside. How pleasant it would be to walk out alone, first along by the river and then through the park. The snow would be lying on the branches of the trees and forming a bright cap on the top of the Wellington Monument. How much more pleasant it would be there than at the supper table. And then, when Greta is standing, uh, listening to Bartle Darcy sing the song on the stairs on page 432, 
Can I get somebody to read from Gabriel had not gone to the door with the others? That's okay. You, 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 can, you can stop there. So think about here what he is um, turning Greta into as he watches her on the stairs. Is he, is he looking at her as though she is a live adult woman with her own inner life or thoughts or attitudes or opinions? What is he thinking about her in terms of here? This is even before the kind of the, the lusting part starts, right? What is he what is he imagining her as here? As being a, like a painting, yeah. And he's looking at the way the colors of her hair and her out, outfit play off against each other, right? So he's thinking about her as a kind of aesthetic object, right? Rather than as a person. And much of Gabriel's thinking tends in this direction, right? He's always thinking about these kind of these isolated sensory moments. Um, there's another one on page 434 uh, when they're walking back to the Gresham Hotel. Um, can I get somebody to read, uh, someone who hasn't read yet, to read, she was walking on before him so lightly and so erect. Okay. Page 434. She was walking on him before so lightly and so erect that he longed to run after her noiselessly, catch her by so she could say something foolish and affectionate, affectionate into her ear. She seemed, you know, she seemed to him so frail that he longed to defend her against something and then to be alone with her. Moments of their secret life together, burst like stars upon his memory, like heliotrope. Envelope was lying beside his breakfast cup and he was caressing it with his hand. Birds were twittering in the eye in the sunny web of the curtain was shimmering along the floor. He could not eat for having his day were standing on the crowded platform. He was placing a ticket inside the warm palm of her glove. He was standing with her and cold looking through a grated window at a man making bottles in a warm furnace. It was very cold. Okay. Her face but stop there, right? Uh, because then he's coming back to reality and what's actually happening around them. But he's thinking about their history together, right, as this series of these kind of isolated sensory moments, right? Not in terms of, you know, say, you know, the children they have raised together or, you know, the overall arc of the life they've shared, right? He is thinking about these particular moments of intense sense impression, right? And so what's happening here, the big thing that's going on here, um, is that Gabriel is being pointed out to us as a follower of an artistic doctrine called aestheticism. How many of you have ever, how many of you have ever heard the phrase art for art's sake? Nobody's ever heard this before? 
Okay, so what this basically means is that for an aestheticist, art has no practical purpose, and that's a good thing. Right? The only role art has to play is to be beautiful. That is its only purpose. And so an aestheticist kind of revels in these kinds of sense pleasures, these beautiful moments. Um, in particular, Gabriel seems to be referencing um, the philosophy of a late Victorian writer by the name of Walter Pater. And Pater wrote a book um, about, it was ostensibly about Renaissance art, but the primary argument of the book was that the way to experience art and to approach life is to kind of hold on to these moments of an intense aesthetic sensation for as long as you can, right? Because, like, um, I think the example Pater gives is, uh, you know, say, so how many of you have heard, like, you've been outside on a hot day and somebody comes and splashes some cold water on you? Yeah, that's happened to pretty much everybody, right? And, you know, like, at first, you get that cold water splashed on you and you get this kind of thrill from it. Right? You know, whether it's a positive or a negative thing, right? You know, you feel all tingly. But then, do you still get that same tingly feeling when somebody throws the cold water on you again? Probably. Yeah, because your, your body is acclimated to it, right? Think, like, think of it also kind of like getting into a swimming pool, right? When you first get into the pool, the water feels cold, and you have a, like a moment of goosebumps, right? But then once you've been in the pool for a minute, your, your body adjusts to the temperature and it's just tepid water. Um, what Pater is trying to figure out how to do is to hold on to that tingly feeling, right? To be able to access that tingly feeling again. So essentially kind of like not to you know, allow your sensations to be deadened by habit. And Gabriel seems consciously or unconsciously to follow more or less the same philosophy, right? He's really kind of interested in these isolated aesthetic sensations and holding on to them and thinking deeply about them, right? But I think that the story's attitude towards Gabriel's aestheticism um, is at least a little bit critical, right? In part because Gabriel is made to look like a ridiculous figure. The, I mean, well, he's really kind of a ridiculous figure throughout the story, right? But it, he doesn't come to realize it himself until the end. Um, now, there's one other feature of his personality that is combined with this uh, that I think really comes out in the rest of his conversation with Miss Ivers. So if we go back to page 419, and can somebody uh, start reading, somebody who hasn't read yet, start reading from O Mr. Conroy in the middle of the page. We come for an excursion to the Aaron Isles. Page 419. Uh, start with, with O Mr. Conroy, we come for an excursion. Irish, as Miss Ivers, 
Well, said Gabriel, if it comes to that, you know, I wish is not my language. Their neighbors had turned to listen to the cross of their nation. Gabriel glanced right and left nervously and tried to keep his good humor under the ordeal, which was making a blush in the baby's forehead. And having you your own land to visit, continues Ivers, that you know nothing of your own people in your own country. Oh, to tell you the truth, retorted Gabriel suddenly. I'm sick of my own country, sick of it. Why, asked Miss Ivers. Gabriel did not answer, but his retort had heeded him. Why, repeated Miss Ivers. They have to go to visiting together, and as he had not answered her, Miss Ivers said warmly, Of course you will answer. Gabriel tried to cover his agitation by taking part in the dance with great energy. He avoided her eyes, for he had seen a sour expression on her face. But when they met in the long chain, he was surprised to feel his hand firmly pressed. She looked at him from under her brows for a moment quizzically until he smiled. Then, just as the chain was about to start again, she stood on her tiptoe and whispered into his ear, Less Brighton, Yeah, okay, you can stop there. Thank you. So, what is the alt? So, they kind of they make their piece about the Daily Express articles, right? And what is this argument about? Why are they why are they at odds here? Because she didn't he didn't want to visit the Iron Isles? Yeah. He doesn't want to go on a trip to the Iron Isles. Where does he want to go instead? Yeah. yeah, he wants to go to continental Europe, right? For a cycling tour. Now what do we remember from past conversations about Irish culture and Irish nationalism? about the Aran Islands. Does anybody remember where they are and what significance they held in the early 20th century Irish imagination? Okay, so the Aran Islands are, right, three little chunks of rock off the coast of Galway in the extreme west of Ireland. So they're about as far west as you can go and still be in Ireland, right? Um, does anybody remember what the role of the west was in the Irish imagination? Like why it matters that these islands would be so far west? Pardon? Oh, well, yeah, it's still you know, part of the primarily, although actually like, there's not enough land for agriculture on the Aran Islands, so they live mostly by fishing. But yeah, we're talking about a place where people would still be living a kind of traditional Irish village lifestyle. Um, and at least the two smaller islands were still at the time predominantly Irish speaking. Right? English had not overtaken the Irish language yet. So the West, the rural agricultural or fishing West, tends to be regarded by early 20th century nationalists as the real Ireland, right? The pure Ireland. The Ireland um, that has not been tainted by British values or by the English language. And that's kind of like where their contention is coming from here. So Miss Ivers, as a nationalist, values the west of Ireland very highly, and the Irish language very highly, even though, of course, this whole conversation is taking place in English. And you know, there are only two words of Irish spoken in the whole story, right? She says, Bianna Glee, you know, blessings on you, as you know, the traditional Irish would, the traditional Irish language would buy as she leaves the party. Um, but she wants Gabriel to come out to the West with her and her friends, and he does not want to. He would prefer to go to Europe. We can connect this with the fact that at the beginning of the story, his wife, who is from the West of Ireland, laughs that he makes her wear galoshes, right? Because everyone wears them on the continent, right? Everyone wears them in Europe. So Gabriel's values 
are what we would call cosmopolitan. Does anybody know what this word means, like apart from, you know, the, the name of a magazine or the name of a drink? Do you mean like he's materialistic? Not necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean materialistic, right? So a nationalist um, is very much focused on the promotion of a specific culture or ethnic group and their um, wants or needs, right? A cosmopolitan is basically the opposite of that. A cosmopolitan is someone who sees themselves as a citizen of the world um, and who wants to see, you know, sort of all cultures valued more or less equally and who wants experience of other cultures. Right? So Gabriel definitely falls into this cosmopolitan category, more so than the nationalist category. Um, in part because how does he seem to feel about the West of Ireland overall? Why can't he just say a polite no thank you to Miss Ivers and leave it at that? In part because she won't let up, right? Mm -hmm. But why else? Why, why, does, why do you think thinking about the West of Ireland gets him so angry? For, yeah he, yeah, he says, I'm sick of my own country, sick of it, right? He doesn't want to be in a more Irish part of Ireland, right? And what about the language issue that she's talking about here, right? She says, you know, haven't you your own language to keep in touch with Irish? Well, said Gabriel, if it comes to that, you know, Irish is not my language. Now, is he wrong when he says this? No, Irish isn't his language, right? He has grown up speaking English. The part of Ireland that he lives in, that he's always lived in, is English speaking. Miss Ivers' first language would also presumably be English. But Miss Ivers is, um, she's speaking the language of a group called the Gaelic League. And I think we talked about the Gaelic League a little bit um, last week. But uh, yeah, the Gaelic League were, presume, were primarily concerned with the resurrection of Irish as a living language, right? So the Irish language uh, by, the early, by, by the end of the 19th century was practically dead in most of Ireland, except in the most rural parts. Basically places like Ireland and other parts of the West, right? Only in fairly remote villages were people still predominantly Irish speaking. So the Irish language had become a kind of class marker. Urban educated people spoke English. Rural uneducated people spoke Irish. So part of the issue here might be that Gabriel kind of looks down on the Irish language a bit, right? You know, he's, you know, we, we know that he is university educated, he's a teacher, he reviews books, right? And he likes to go on vacations to continental Europe. Um, but another thing that's going on here, too, is that the Gaelic League really did, uh, kind of through their insistence on speaking Irish, um, and writing letters to each other in Irish and dressing their letters in Irish, they did become, um, at least in Joyce's estimation, often a kind of disruptive uh, force within Dublin life. Like, for example, he wrote about how, um, you know, the poor postman would get these letters from Gaelic leaguers to each other, and he'd be reading the address trying to figure out, like, where the fuck is this supposed to go, right? Because most urban people did not speak Irish. So there is actually a kind of debate at work here over what language people should be speaking in Ireland, right? And you know, we'll, when we looked at Yeats last time and the idea of cultural nationalism and the literary revival, the literary revival kind of sidestepped that issue 
by trying to use Irish content to create an English language Irish literature, right? Does that make sense? Everybody got me, everybody with me there? Okay. Um, the Gaelic leaders instead kind of wanted, return, wanted to return people to speaking Irish. In fact, they were successful up to a point. Irish is now a compulsory subject in schools in Ireland. Everybody has to take it. Um, and while I, an Irish name used to be a class marker that indicated peasant origins, it's now a class marker that indicates upper middle class origins. So you are more likely in Ireland today to meet people of the upper middle classes, um, you know, the professional classes and whatnot, who have Irish names than people who come from the country. Um, right, so there's another reason, though, why this talk of the West gets Gabriel so heated. And If we turn back to page 419, and Miss Ivor's initial invitation, right? <laughs> it would be splendid for Greta, too, if she'd come. She's from Connacht, isn't she? Her people are, said Gabriel shortly. Does Gabriel seem to like to be reminded that his wife is from the West? Yeah, there's something about that that rankles him, right? He doesn't like it whenever people bring up Greta's Western origins. Um, you know, he thinks about his mother, like um, on the previous page, page 418, he's looking at the picture of his mother. And a shadow passed over his face as he remembered his, her sullen opposition to his marriage. Some slighting phrases she had used still rankled in his memory. She had once spoken of Greta as being country cute, and that was not true of Greta at all. It was Greta who had nursed her during all her last long illness in their house at Monkstown. So cute, um, in this instance, doesn't mean what we tend to take cute to mean. Right? So cute didn't always mean like something little and fuzzy with big eyes that you want to hug, right? Cute used to mean clever and conniving. And it was a stereotype among Dubliners that country Irish were like this, right? That they would try to, they always, they would always try to get one over on you if they could. So that's why Gabriel's mother thought of Greta as country cute, right? That you know she was, you know, um, a gold digger or a social climber from the from the sticks, trying to get her get her claws into her son. So Gabriel seems to be bothered whenever he's reminded that his wife comes from the West. In fact, he doesn't seem to like thinking of her as having a history at all, right? Prior to her life with him. I mean, they've presumably been married a long time, right? They have, you know, they have two children. They have a nice little suburban house together. Um, and you know, they, you know, seem, you know, they, they seem to have been you know, sharing a life for quite some number of years. So, so what that this is the first, like that this moment in the hotel is the first he's ever heard of this Michael Fury. Right. He's basically ignored the, first, the, the whole first half of his wife's life, right? and is only interested, really, in the half that she shared with him. <clears throat> so let's turn for a second here to the beginning of the story. Page 413. Not the exact beginning, but close. When Gabriel is first introduced, can I get somebody uh, to read uh, the paragraph that starts with he was a stout, tallish young man? Somebody who hasn't read yet. He was a stout, tallish young man, 
the high color of his cheeks pushed upwards even to his forehead where he had scattered itself in a few formless patches of pale red and on his hairless face there scintillated scintillated restlessly the polished lenses and the bright gilt rims of the glasses which screened his delicate and restless eyes his glossy black hair was parted in the middle and brushed in a long curve behind his ears where it curled slightly beneath the groove left by his hat okay thank you so there are a couple of words here that i want to focus on because they tell us something about the way we're supposed to perceive gabriel so he's described as young, right, even though we know he's about 40 from context. His face is hairless. And we see that he has um, high color in his cheeks, like he's blushing, right? And he's got glasses. So what do these things add up to? Like, how, how would we say we're supposed to perceive Gabriel as he enters the room? With his hairless face, his youth, his delicate eyes, his glasses, and the blush on his face. Is he described in terms that make him seem, sound more like a mature adult or more almost like a boy? Yeah, the hairless face in particular, right, indicates boyishness and youth. And the glasses are also important here, right? On his hairless face, they're scintillated restlessly, the polished lenses and the bright gilt rims of the glasses which screened his delicate and restless eyes. So pay attention here to what the glasses do, right? They screen his eyes. So, <clears throat> we all know what the basic, you know, more than half of you are wearing glasses. We all know what the basic purpose of, of a pair of glasses is, right? You know, it's to, you know, it's to, you know, to enhance your vision, right? But what else do they, like, what, do they, what, do, what does a pair of glasses put between you and the rest of the world? Yeah, exactly. So, Gabriel, the esthete, right, is always at l looking at everything through something else, right? These glasses that screen his eyes are always between him and the things that he's looking at, right? So these glasses place a kind of aesthetic distance between Gabriel and the rest of the world. So he's always looking at everything from a slight remove. Like, for example, when he's standing watching his wife in the staircase, right? And he turns her into an aesthetic object, right? You know, he says, ah, if, you know, if she were a painting, this is what I would call her, right? So, <clears throat> it might be interesting to compare Gabriel to some of the other characters in the story as well, for a variety of reasons. So we have this other guy, this Mr. Brown, the only Protestant in the room, who is comparable to Gabriel, that he also keeps failing with women, right? He keeps trying to make jokes at the girls, and it creeps them out, and they back away. And the character who's probably most likely a kind of doppelganger for Gabriel is Freddie Malins. Right, the drunk who shows up late. 
So if you look on page 417, we get the physical description here of Freddy. Can somebody read this for us? Like in, fa in fact, right behind her, Gabriel can be seen piloting Freddie Malins. In fact, right behind her, Gabriel, Gabriel could be seen piloting Freddie Malins across the landing. The latter young man of about 40 was of Gabriel's size and build with very round shoulders. His face was fleshy and pally. Touch with color only at the dick hanging low to his ear and at the wild wings of his nose. He had coarse features, a blunt nose, a convex, and receding brow and two mid and protruded lips. His heavy lidded eyes and the disorder of his scanty hair made him look sleepy. He was laughing hardly in a high key at a story which he had been telling Gary on the stairs and at the same time rubbing the knuckles of his left fist backwards and forwards onto his left thigh. Okay, so what does Freddie Malins look like? He sound like he's old. He's only 40. He's the same age as Gabriel. I mean, his facial the future he seemed like he's older than that though. Okay, yeah, I mean, perhaps aged by drink and hard living, right? Yeah, probably. But if we think back to those cartoon characters that I showed you a couple sessions ago, um, you, know, you know, British representations of the Irish in political cartoons, right? That's kind of what Freddy is supposed to look like, right? He's supposed to look like this kind of ape-like caricature, right? He is that stage Irishman. Right, the comic figure that English audiences recognize and make fun of. Right, the ape-like Irishman. Who can't, you know, he can't stay away from drink, right? <clears throat> he can't stop himself from telling kind of incoherent jokes and stories. And <clears throat> everything about him, you know, speaks of sort of carelessness and irresponsibility, right? And I think that in some sense, Freddy is what Gabriel fears being, right? Or fears being perceived as. It is as this kind of Irish stereotype. And we also, you know, we don't have too much time here. We also really haven't talked too much about the aunts. And Mary Jane, right? So we've got the, the, the Mrs. Morgan here. All right, we've got Aunt Julia. Aunt Kate and their niece, Mary Jane. They actually do. Now, they are differentiated, right? For one thing, we know that Aunt Julia is a singer, right? She used to be, she had the lead soprano in one of the choirs um, in Dublin, which, which actually would have been, a church choir position would have actually been a paid position, would have been her job. We know that Aunt Kate gives piano lessons to beginners. And that Mary Jane is also a music teacher who's taken a degree from the Royal Academy of Irish Music. So all three of these women are professional musicians, right? So we have here, like we had in Goblin Market, a household of independent women who make their own living, right? Though in this case, um, their independence might be a little bit less voluntary. Um, and that's one of the reasons why 
the song arrayed for the bridal is so important here. Um, so what do we know about Gabriel's relationship to Aunt Julia and Aunt Kate? How is he related to them? Yeah, he's their nephew, right? Who was his mother? The elder sister of Julia and Kate, right? Yeah, that's actually yeah, on page 418 it talks about, you know, his mother, right? <clears throat> the elder sister of Julia and Kate. Um, who <clears throat> what they called the brains carrier of the family, right? Now, the way Irish marriage worked in the early 20th century was on a dowry system. So, a typical middle class family, if they had several children, would probably only have enough money put aside for the oldest daughter to have a dowry to get married. So when Aunt Julia sings Arrayed for the Bridal, it's ironic because she is an elderly spinster who would never have had the opportunity to get married, right? Simply by being, by virtue of being a younger daughter, whose older sister took all the dowry money. So the Mrs. Morgan are independent of necessity, right? They work because <clears throat> of essentially because of the way you know Irish family structure. Uh, was set up in the early 20th century. And this is, again, largely an imitation of, uh, was it, I mean, an imitation of British Victorian cultural values. Um, we can see some of this happening on page 431. There's this passage uh, where Gabriel tells a story about the old gentleman, his grandfather, and the horse Johnny. And the old gentleman wants to, he wants to go out on parade with his horse and cart with the quality, that is, you know, with the Anglo-Irish nobility in the city. And the horse, thinking it's back in the mill, won't stop walking round and round the statue of King William III. Now, do any of us remember the significance in Irish history of the English King William III? in 1690 defeated the deposed English King James II who fled to Ireland and afterwards to prevent the Irish from rising up against the English again instituted all those penal laws, right? So King William III is a figure in history who, tend to, who tends to be um, a hero to Irish Protestants and a villain to Irish Catholics. And what's happening here is that the old gentleman's horse falling into this pattern of reverence for the statue, right, indicates a kind of paralysis in Irish Catholic life in Dublin, right? He just keeps walking round and round around the statue of this old oppressor.
And this then also forms a kind of context for Gabriel's West Britain-ness, right? But before we finish up here, I do want to, um, I want to look at the end of the story in part just because this last part, starting on page 439, is it's beautifully written. And I think just paying a little bit of attention to you know, the aesthetic beauty of the written word now and again is actually valuable and a good thing. And this is also where Gabriel is coming to his kind of final conclusions, his final realizations, right? So page 439, Gabriel's watching Greta uh, fall asleep. She's cried herself to sleep. She was fast asleep. Gabriel, leaning on his elbow, looked for a few moments unresentfully on her tangled hair and half-open mouth, listening to her deep-drawn breath. So she had had that romance in her life. A man had died for her sake. It hardly pained him now to think how poor a part he, her husband, had played in her life. He watched her while she slept as though he and she had never lived together as man and wife. His curious eyes rested long upon her face and on her hair. And as he thought of what she must have been then, in that time of her first girlish beauty, a strange friendly pity for her entered his soul. He did not like to say, even to himself, that her face was no longer beautiful, but he knew that it was no longer the face for which Michael Fury had braved death. Perhaps she had not told him all the story. His eyes moved to the chair over which she had thrown some of her clothes. A petticoat string dangled to the floor. One boot stood upright, its limp upper fallen down. The fellow of it lay upon its side. He wondered at his riot of emotions an hour before. From what had it proceeded? From his aunt's supper, from his own foolish speech, from the wine and dancing, the merrymaking when saying good night in the hall, the pleasure of the walk along the river in the snow. Poor Aunt Julia. She too would soon be a shade with the, with the shade of Patrick Morgan and his horse. She had, he had caught that haggard look upon her face for a moment when she was singing arrayed for the bridal. Soon, perhaps, he would be sitting in that same drawing room, dressed in black, his silk hat on his knees. The blinds would be drawn down and Aunt Kate would be sitting beside him, crying and blowing her nose and telling him how Julia had died. He would cast about in his mind for some words that might console her and would find only lame and useless ones. Yes, yes, that would happen very soon. The air of the room chilled his shoulders. He stretched himself cautiously along under the sheets and lay down beside his wife. One by one, they were all becoming shades. Better pass boldly into that other world in the full glory of some passion than fade and wither dismally with age. He thought of how she who lay beside him had locked in her heart for so many years that image of her lover's eyes when he had told her that he did not wish to live. Generous tears filled Gabriel's eyes. He had never felt like that himself towards any woman, but he knew that such a feeling must be love. The tears gathered more thickly in his eyes and in the partial darkness he imagined he saw the form of a young man standing under a dripping tree. Other forms were near. His soul had approached that region where dwell the vast hosts of the dead. He was conscious of, but could not apprehend, their wayward and flickering existence. His own identity was fading out into a gray, impalpable world. The solid world itself, which these dead had one time reared and lived in, was dissolving and dwindling. A few light taps on the pane made him turn to the window. It had begun to snow again. He watched sleepily the flakes, silver and dark, falling obliquely against the lamplight. The time had come for him to set out on his own journey westward. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. It was falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly on the bog of Allen and farther westward, softly falling into the dark, mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling, too, upon every part of the lonely church yard on the hill where Michael Fury lay buried. It lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling, like the descent of their last end, upon all the living and the dead. We'll stop there.